I did preach a message the other night, Wednesday night, that dealt with the subject of Christianity versus Islam. And then I put a smaller rendition of it on the radio broadcast. There has been quite a few orders for that little sermon. So y'all pray for me. Thursday night, I got a great opportunity to go all the way over there towards St. Petersburg and speak in a Bible study. How many of y'all was in that Bible study over here? Right there. Angel had me come over there and then fed me, treated me like a king. Here, boy. It was uh, really good and enjoyable. Kind of hard to know how to get started today because I had already told you what I was going to speak on today. Anybody remember? Two of you. Thank you. I told you that I was going to speak on a subject about this alcohol business and drinking and stuff. I remember reading one time that Billy Sunday says, if I was president of the United States, I'd make this country so dry you'd have to prime a man before he could spit. I thought that was pretty good. But I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew in chapter 12. I got a lot of things to say, so we're going to have to move on. Here in Matthew chapter 12, page 1013 in your Bible, if you think or believe that it's okay for a social drink, you know, just a little social. You don't get too social. I was always told if you don't hit the fifth on the fourth, you'll be able to go forth on the fifth. Y'all will figure that out after a while. But you may believe that it's okay for a little alcohol. Uh, I'm glad that your eternal destiny does not depend on whether or not you drink or you don't drink. No more than it does if you smoke or don't smoke. Uh, I'd rather you smoke here than later. <laughs> uh, you know, that just warmed my soul to know that you were paying attention and got that. But look at it down in verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's a pretty strong statement coming from the Son of God. Now, I'm not going to get into the ramifications of all of that. I'm just going to tell you, if that was true, and he said it, whatever it means... Don't you think you ought to be very careful of what you say? Good, bad, or indifferent. You have to be careful of what you say. Uh, not only that, I wouldn't want to do anything that would dull my mind so that I couldn't think clearly. If we do believe we have to give an account for what we say and do, we ought to be careful of anything that would control our mind so we could not be sharp and think clearly. Just something to think about. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn very quickly to the book of Galatians in chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians and chapter 5. I just want you to see where this word is found so that you'll know what God thinks of it. Let's just take the word drunkenness, drunkard. Today we call it, he's an alcoholic. And we know that today it's a, it's a disease. It's a disease you can get out of a bottle. And if you didn't drink it, you wouldn't get this disease. Isn't that amazing? The only disease you can get by drinking. Well, anyway, you notice there in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, reveling, such like. Drunkenness? You mean right along with all those other things? Those bad things? Well, it's, it's, it's right there. It's, it's one of those bad. Murder, drunkenness, adultery. And if you think it's okay to be a drunk, you got a spiritual problem. 
I just want you to see that God puts that in the category of the flesh. It's not in the, if you go down there to verse 22 and 23, you don't find it in the category of the spirit. So that you know where it's coming from. So that you just understand that and believe it. Now turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is why it's so important. Have a Bible. If you don't have one with you this morning, there's one right there in the pew in front of you. Follow along. See what the Bible said. Uh, listen, if you want to do something, you can justify it. But be careful when you say, God said, when God didn't say that. Well, don't you know, Yankee, I mean, you ought to know this. Jesus made wine. I mean, everybody knows that. Jesus turned the water into wine, right? Yes, he did. So this morning, what's in those little cups? Grape juice. Well, it could be wine. It, grape juice. But anyway, I'll get to that in just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look what he says here in verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in the verse right before that, it's even a few other bad things. So, this is of the flesh. This is uh, not good. It uh, doesn't come with God's highest recommendations. So, are there a lot of people you think in America that get drunk? What about people who drink, but they can really hold it? They can hold their own. You know, it doesn't bother them. And the more sociable they get because the more drinks they have. And after all, it's just like Paul told Timothy, a little wine for the tummy's sake. And of course, your name is Timothy, and uh, you have tummy problems. Now, do I believe that it's okay to drink strong drink? No. So we don't get mixed up somewhere along the line and say, I wonder if he's for it or against it. <laughs> I want you to be definitely clear. Now you say, you just don't understand. Oh, don't I. My father was a bootlegger. Now for you that don't know what that means, it means he made, well, he sold corn. In jugs. They call it white lightning and rot gut. Yes, I have been. My dad's name was called Shine because of moonshine. So, yes, I know a lot about it. I've watched, I've seen the results of it, and I've been raised and seen around. My mother was a bartender for most of her life. That's the job she had. She was a bartender. She served the alcohol, the drinks, and on occasion would have a little nip. I have two sisters that were drunkards. You see, y'all say it, they had alcohol. They were drunkards. That's the term the Bible uses, and I don't quite wash anything. If that's what God says, that's what God says. But anyway, is it right or is it wrong? Understand the consequences and why God says what he does. Remember, anytime God says don't do something because he doesn't want you to hurt yourself. Because things hurt us, but we don't know it until it's too late. And um, I, I want you to just to know that. Now, I'm not getting into what these verses are all saying right now. But just to let you know, when you trust Christ as your Savior, regardless of what you have done, all sin has all been paid. Every sin, Christ died and paid for those sins. So that a drunkard, an adulterer, a murderer, you name it, could still go to heaven when they die. Some people don't believe that. But I believe it because it's in the Bible. Christ died for all the world. But his description is talking about the things that people do in the world. And wants you to know how bad things are so you know how gracious God is. That God can save anyone. Now, God can't save a good man. There aren't any. He can only save sinners. You qualify. So do I. So we're all qualifying in this great scheme of things. About how we can have eternal life as a free gift. Now, <clears throat> I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Leviticus. 
Look first of all in the book of Numbers. You're right there, so look in the book of Numbers. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And Numbers chapter 4. And just to show you real quick, uh, Aaron, the tribe of Levi, the priesthood, uh, there's certain things that God told them that you need to be aware of. So look there in chapter 4, look in verse 3. Verse 3 says, thank you, sir. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation, blah, 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 uh, it goes on down here. It says, this is about how old they were. And it's important to remember that because Jesus Christ was about 30 years of age in the book of Luke, in chapter 3, verse 23, when it says Jesus, been as was supposed, about 30 years of age, he went and began his ministry. And he was also a prophet, priest, and king. So there was things that the priest could not do. And it also mentioned it back here in the book of Numbers. So now look there in the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus. Leviticus in chapter 10. Chapter 10, and notice there in verse 3. When he's talking to the, the priest and what they were allowed to do and not allowed to do, God would separate that which is clean from unclean, holy and unholy. But he makes a statement in verse 3, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. This is what they were supposed to do. Now, notice what he says in verse 9. Verse 9, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Look in verse 10. And that you put, may put difference between holy and unholy between unclean and clean. So God makes a difference. Strong drink and wine, when it moveth in the cup, God says is unclean. Now, you can do whatever, people can do whatever they want, and they will. You hear about college kids going on a binge, just drink until they pass out. And there's no consequence. Why do you think, if you'll keep it in mind, Men always want to take a girl out to a bar, and the first thing they want to do is to get them a drink. Get them a drink. Why? Why? Because alcohol causes you to lose your resistance. You, 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 you'll, you'll be easily led and talked into doing things you wouldn't do if you was in a clear mind. So you understand that's not a wise thing to do. Uh, best is don't go to the bar. I don't, I don't go to bars. Only time I went to bars was up in Rima, Minnesota, and that was to put up my poster that I had a meeting going on. Son of a bootlegger, and I told him what I was speaking of. And a lot of the people from the <laughs> beer joint, they came to the meeting. A lot of them trusted Christ the Savior. Somebody, and the preacher that was with me, he said, you're going in there? I said, yes, I am. Now, did I go in there to get a drink? No. Did I go in there to fellowship with the boys? No. I went in there to let them know, hey, I'm a preacher, and I'm going to be preaching. Some of them came out just to hear the son of a moonshiner. Anyway, but notice that verse 10, that there, you may put a difference. Then he says in verse 11, and that you may teach the children of Israel. So you're not only to do it, you're not to do it yourself, you're to teach the children. So when you want to try to make the Bible say something that it doesn't say, now listen, there are some things and words that talks about wine and talks about the wine press. And about intoxicating wine. And then the wine is just grape juice. All those things are found clearly in the Word of God. I know that. Now, turn in your Bible to the book of Judges 13. The book of Judges <coughs> in chapter 13. And notice now, we know there's a story about a guy named Samson. Everybody heard of Samson? You know the strong guy? You know, 
built kind of like I am? I heard that was. In Judges in chapter 13, look what he says now. He's telling the parents that this is what this boy is going to be like. This is what I want you to do. In verse 7, but he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. So the strong stuff is also considered unclean, because we read that back here in Leviticus and so on. For a child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And the Bible says, Jesus was called a Nazarene. He also had a vow. I don't believe Jesus drank strong, intoxicating wine or liquors of any kind. Just don't believe it. And somebody said, well, I just show the verse, just chapter and verse, that they won't be able to find that. Now, look in the book of uh, Luke chapter 1, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we're talking about John the Baptist going to be born. And it says here in verse 15, <coughs> verse 15, he says, For he, talking about John the Baptist, shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall be a drunkard. No, he didn't say that and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And God's going to use him to turn a lot of people's hearts to the Lord. Jesus says there's not a man born of woman greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist never touched the stuff. He never touched the stuff. Uh, the Word of God tells us that. So, People who want to do something can justify anything you want to do. If you want to have sex outside of marriage, you'll find a good reason to do it. Well, we love each other. Find that in the Bible. Well, because you love each other, it's okay. No, it's not. You go by what the book says. Now, I'm so glad that regardless of whether people do or don't, it doesn't affect salvation. It doesn't mean I can't get to go to heaven. Christ died on the cross to pay for the sins of people. And everybody is a sinner. Everybody's done things wrong. But when Christ died, he paid for all of it. Now, once you trust Christ as Savior and you're God's child, now God tells us in his word how to live. So there's things that God doesn't want us to do because it's not good for us. It's not good for the children to learn. I've never wanted my children to learn some of the things of the world. Now, if they learn it, they didn't learn it from me. But I, 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 I've never touched a drop in my life. Strongest thing I've ever had was Formula 44 cough syrup and uh, one swig of that there like to do me in. And I, when I found out, hey, that's, that's alcohol. I won't touch it no more. That, that, that's the strongest thing I've ever had in my life. Besides strong coffee. I love coffee. But the Word of God gives us an idea what we're supposed to believe. Now turn in your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. The book of Ephesians chapter 5. A lot of people love this verse because it says in verse 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. It's okay to drink a little wine, just don't drink too much. Okay. You can take that if you want to, but it means you don't drink it if it gives an influence. But cause the rest of the verse, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, influenced by the Holy Spirit, but you don't drink strong drink that you might be influenced by it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> and it does bother them. It's just that they don't know how much it bothers Well, listen, if getting drunk is so bad, why run the risk? Why, why see how close you can come to the edge of the cliff? I would rather want to stay as far away from the edge as I possibly could. Not to see how close I can get without going over. 
I believe that you'll be wiser if you do what God says do. But you'll notice that the Bible does talk about do not drink strong drink. Find the verse that says God commanded us to drink strong drink. It's not there. But it is a prohibition against it, but never for it. Now, a verse that I wanted to show you also, found here in the book of Proverbs in chapter 3. Just go to there right quick and look at this. There's a couple of verses that I want you to see there. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. <coughs> and look in verse 9. Remember, the priest of Aaron, they eat and drink what the people brought to be sacrificed or given. They lived off of the other 11 tribes, the tribe of Levi. So they would bring things, and they would offer it. And so they got to eat some of the sacrifice and some of the things to drink. But the priest could not drink strong drink. That was not permitted. So, if they could not, then I don't believe the people would be bringing that. But notice what he says here in verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This is what the first fruits is what they also brought to the temple. And they could not have been fermented drink. It had to be new wine, fresh. Now, there's different words that are used, and I have it down here, and I got it all in my notes. I got three different, two different Hebrew words, one Greek word, and how many times they're used in the Old Testament, and when they're used, meaning a fermented drink, and when it's not a fermented drink, and the word uh, oinos, which is Greek 28 times in the New Testament, and how all those things were used. I've spent some time studying the Bible, because I know that I'm going to have to give account to God for whatever I teach. And so I know that I have to try to be as accurate as I possibly can. So I don't have an ulterior motive. I'm not going to drink so that i got to find some verses to justify it. I just take the Bible and study. So what does God's Word have to say about the subject? And I simply want to pass that on because I believe that it is so important. First pressed grape juice. The only thing is they didn't have the refrigeration like we have today. If you had grape juice today, if you just let it sit long enough, you'll have intoxicating wine on down the road. So the word wine can be used for fresh grapefruit and can be used for the other because it's the same stuff. It's just that one moveth in the cup. So you wonder, well, what does that mean? So take your Bible while you're right here in Proverbs and look in chapter 20 of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20. And notice what he says in verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is what? I don't believe that it's the best for God's children to set an example. Well, just as long as you don't drink too much. And how, pray tell, do you determine how much is too much? And whenever your children watch what parents do, do they cut it off at the same point? How much would it take? At what time do you, when you say, well, it doesn't bother me, didn't that verse just say, deceive themselves? Did you see the word deceived there? Is deceived. Whosoever deceived, not wise. But of course, you know, when, when you want to do what you want to do, it's going to be done. Look in chapter 23 of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 23. Look in verse 21. Verse 21. Well, just look at verse 20. It's right there also. It says, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. You don't 
hear a lot of good things about this. You say, well, how do you know when it's uh, really fermented? Well, the Bible even kind of gives you a clue at that too. Look on down there in uh, verse 29. Look at verse 29, where it says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? You ever seen a drunk babble? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Sometimes I do because I don't get enough sleep, but I mean, that's not the same thing. Yeah. Verse 30, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It means it's fermented. It means it's strong, intoxicating. I mean, if you drink some of it, you can get drunk. God says, don't look at it when it's fermented. Well, if you don't look at it, you probably wouldn't drink it. I believe the scriptures are pretty clear. And then notice what he says here in verse 32. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder, like a rattlesnake that's got poison in its venom, in its fangs that's going to get you. I have a lot of people that I've dealt with over the years because being a preacher, you deal with people who have all kinds of addiction problems. And one of the biggest and the worst that there can possibly be is alcohol. I've watched so many homes ruined because of a dad who become a drunk or even a wife that becomes a drunk. I've had to deal with that. Some of this I've dealt with since I have been here. And that's not a lie. And the impact that it makes upon the children, how it divides the home. It ruins their whole life savings and what they go through, and they can't hold a job. All kinds of things that happen. And some people are gambling. They're just rolling the dice. Russian roulette. It won't get me. You heard about the mosquito flying around the flames of the fire. You know, it won't get me, it won't get me, it won't get me, it won't get me. It got him. And that's the way it is with some people. Uh, these verses are clear, but take your Bible and look over there in the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk. In the book of Habakkuk, there's a, several scriptures uh, that kind of gives you the idea that it's uh, maybe not the best thing to do. Look what he says in Habakkuk chapter 2. This is on page 957. And look in verse 14. A positive and then a negative. Positive, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Verse 15, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink and putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. This is why there's so much trouble that goes on, and a lot of problems because of, you know, the breakup of the home, and some man taking his wife to some bar, and they get to drinking, and then a woman dancing with some other man and some man dancing with some other woman's not as right. Listen, that's trouble, trouble, trouble. I don't want another man putting his hands on my wife. And the last thing I need to do is put my arms around some other woman and dancing with some music. Now listen, if you don't like what I'm saying, you be thankful for what I hold back. <laughs> but that's foolishness. It leads to trouble. So you don't do that. Now, the scriptures are clear in some of these things, and sometimes it's a little difficult to understand. But let's see if we can look at one more while we're here in the Old Testament. Look in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21. <coughs> Deuteronomy Chapter 21. A man and a wife have a rebellious son. Years ago, they had a, a Ways and Means Committee on how to deal with a rebellious child. 
Uh, notice what it says in verse 20. And they shall say unto the elders of this city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. We don't have anybody like that today, do we? He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. Getting drunk is an evil thing. You'd be surprised how much crime is committed because people drink, get on drugs. Things that shape their thinking from being sound. If a man is going to have to account to God for all of his actions and his thinking, I wouldn't want to do something that would cloud my mind so I couldn't think clearly. Just think about it. It's a foolish thing. And yet there's people that do it all the time and justify it. And the Bible talks about how that they will vomit. You know what I have missed? I have lived, Wednesday, will be 73 years. I have never, and this really bothers me, I have never woke up with a headache and vomiting all night long. But a lot of people have got that experience. You don't have to do what the world does. I think the scriptures are pretty clear that that's not something that God wants us to do. Turn in your Bible to the book of, well, let's just look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians and chapter 5. You may not have known that this verse was in the Bible, but I, I guess I need to show it to you. This is what God's Word has to say. 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, in verse 9, verse 9, says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Verse 10, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetousness, or the extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you have needs go out of the world. In other words, the only way you can keep from becoming associated with anybody in the world is God had to take you out of it. Why? Because there's sinful people in the world. God can't keep you from everybody because then how would you witness to anybody? So there has to be contact made in the world. But what you have to watch is that you reach them, not them reach you. Who's influencing who? If you have a problem with alcohol, the last thing you need is to hang around people who drink alcohol. And if you're trying to live a clean, pure life, the last thing you need is to stand around people and go with people and have close friends who are cheating on their wives or their husbands, running around and telling dirty jokes and things like that. It, don't, it doesn't keep your mind clean and pure. Have good friends, godly friends. So I just can't do it. Yes, you can. You can do it. Be, be, be the stabilizer. Then look what else he says here. In verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortion, would such a one know not to even eat? You say, well, uh, that's pretty hard. I know. But did I read that out of the book? Is that the New Testament? Is this written to a church? Do you know what they were doing on the Lord's Supper? Which is where we're headed. You see, I believe that if God says, when we have the bread, it's to be unleavened bread. It means no yeast in it. I mean, there's no bacteria in there to cause it, create gas and cause it to rise. Uh, you see, in Israel time, they had to be in a hurry. There was no time for that. It was without yeast. Leaven a lot of time has the connotation, connotation of a sin, something wrong, cursed, not good. So that's why we have the bread without the yeast in it. It's flat. It has a 
no taste pretty much. It's blah. But it represents the body of Christ is to be pure. Do you think that is okay for the bread? But it's okay for the grape juice to be fermented because of bacteria and, and causing to stir in the cup. And that's, that, that, that represents the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't believe that intoxicating wine represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I think if you're going to keep it with the bread, you ought to keep it with the blood. They're both precious. And they're both to be kept pure. When Jesus went to the wedding and made the, well, the water into wine, do you believe that Jesus made intoxicating drink that everybody could get their fill and then everybody become drunk at the party? Oh, they'd probably remember the party. Well, maybe they won't remember the party either. But I don't believe he made intoxicating wine. There's only one word for wine. It's that word that means fresh grape juice, but in time, it produces contamination stuff. And that's what you need to be careful of. There's an, another verse in the Bible that we won't take the time to look at, but I, let me explain it to you. The Bible says you do not take new wine and put into old sheepskins. Because, you see, new wine into an old sheepskin, if it sets long, it builds up the gas and it will cause it to burst. But he says you put new wine into new sheepskins. And that's the reason. Because, see, if it's fermented, it'll bust it. Fermented wine into an old bag will not build anymore. It's already done, done its job. It's already fermented. New wine has yet to have fermentation. So the Bible says you don't do that. And so God has given to us a teaching that we should understand. It is of the flesh, and the flesh can desire it. And you may love to get drunk once in a while. My kids never saw a can of beer in our home. You will not open our refrigerator and find strong drink for a little tummy sake. I don't have it there. I'll die of a stomach problem first. But I don't believe that it's wise to set a bad example on something that God says, this can hurt you. You're not going to think clearly. It's going to cloud your mind. And you're going to say things you shouldn't say. And you're not going to be able to do the things. Your judgment is impaired. Why do you think even there is a law that if they catch you driving and they give you a breath test, if it's over a certain percentage, they consider you impaired to drive? You're not fit to drive. Well, what about a Christian? Should a Christian be like that? You think it through. I believe that Christians ought to be of the highest standard of good character, good integrity, and that our minds ought to be clear and sharp. Now, we get a little bit older, we're not going to be able to help it too much. I told somebody the other day, I said, my, my computer up here is, well, it's only got so many gigabytes. And it's full. And the only way I can remember new stuff is I got to go in there and delete some old stuff. So when you ask me something and I don't remember, it's because that was deleted. It wasn't considered important. <laughs> now, go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So when the Lord tells us in his word, when you take this bread, it represents the body of Christ. And when you take the grape juice, the wine, this grape juice, it represents the blood of Christ. And the body was pure and the blood was precious. Incorruptible blood. Nothing in it that could ever cause it to be changed. 
It can never be changed. And that's why I believe that we need to be very careful. Now, a lot of churches, they will serve you the real stuff. And I notice that whenever they have their communion service, some of y'all go to those churches so that you can get some of the... Uh, no, no, I'm just joking. Now, remember this. I still love you. I want you to say it back. I want you to tell me. Preacher, I still love you. I can't say it. Preacher, I still love you. I, I, you weren't together. Preacher, I still love you. Preacher, thank you. It's not nice to lie in a church. It's not nice. So I'm assuming you all told the truth. Because that's what I'm trying to tell you. But it, if, 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 you're, if I go to your house and I open up a refrigerator and it's loaded with nothing but beer and strong drink. That's between you and the Lord. I may never come back again, but that's between you and the Lord. But I think you need to be wise. I'd throw the stuff out, pour it down the drain. And whatever you have done, don't do it anymore. Just don't do it no more. You can't change everything that's ever been done, but you can, you can, you can live a pure life from here on out. You're God's child. Live like God's child. And go by what the Word of God says. Don't let the world... Have you ever noticed on these beer commercials, they'll have it on there and they're at the campfire and they're all drinking, they all got their can in their hand. It doesn't get any better than this. I think, duh. Why don't they show, show some big old fat woman hanging over a bar stool and her teeth are all out and look like a hag and she's sitting there, it don't get any better than this. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Look up here. Look up here. This is you and me. Not that we got to get serious here. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin on us. God loves all of us. We've all sinned. Did we just maybe not do the same one, but we got enough. And the Bible says that God loves us, but to pay for our sin is eternal separation from him. So to go to heaven, you have to be perfect as righteous as God, and none of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. That's why we, we need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. We are sinners. That's what we do. And we're good at it. We're experts. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us, but he hates our sin. Our sin separates us from God. So Christ, who had no sin, took ours, paid for them on the cross, came back from the dead and said, if we would believe he did it for us, he put that payment to our account, and we go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for us. That's a gift. That's free. So God loves you in spite of anything you've ever done or ever will do and will give you the free gift of eternal life. You can go to heaven on what he did. You don't go to heaven because you deserve it. You never will. Neither will I. Nobody deserves it. It's a gift. It's free because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, I pray that you have trusted Christ as your Savior. But if you haven't, why not right now, just between you and the Lord, say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Christ died, paid for my sins. And I'm going to trust him as my only hope of going to heaven. And friend, if you'll believe that and trust him, I'd like to have prayer for you. So I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand and let me know that you're trusting Christ as your Savior this morning. If you've already done it, you never have to do it again. But if you haven't, and what I said made sense. You say, I want to go to heaven, and I want to trust Christ right now. Would you slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Is anyone at all? Anyone at all? If you're watching by internet, right on the screen, it says, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. We'd love to know that someone trusted the Lord. Father, we ask your blessings upon each one here. And Father, as your children, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, to realize that there's, there's no leaven, there's no sin in the bread. And that there's no fermentation in the, the grape juice because it represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.